Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, the South Korean Air Force is looking to acquire stealth detection radar by mid-2020 as neighboring China, Japan and Russia seek to equip themselves with stealth jets in the coming years. Seoul decries Tokyo's latest promotion of the Korea-controlled Tokdo Islands as its own territory. But Tokyo insists it will continue what it describes as furthering a better understanding of Japan. Plus, the White House denies allegations that the U.S. has tapped into German Chancellor Angela Merkel's mobile phone. Berlin has demanded a clarification for the claims. Daybreak begins now. Watching Daybreak on Thursday, October 24th, and I'm Choi Yusun in Seoul. With the security situation in the Asia Pacific region in flux, the Korean military plans to boost its defense capabilities in the sea and in the air within the next 10 years. Our Defense Ministry correspondent Han Dae-eun explains how, in particular, officials want more ships and stealth detecting capabilities. The Korean Air Force reportedly plans to procure stealth-detecting radars by mid-2020 to further boost the nation's air defenses. A military official speaking under the condition of anonymity said the Air Force requested the procurement of stealth-detecting radars in 2011, a request the Joint Chiefs of Staff accepted the following year. The official added it hasn't yet been decided whether to import the radars from overseas or to develop them with Korea's own technology. The move comes as military documents show that Korea's neighbors, particularly China, Japan and Russia, are racing to lay hands on stealth fighter jets with specific plans to either procure or develop them sometime between 2016 and 2019. Meanwhile, the Korean Navy is hoping to push up the timeline for the procurement of three Aegis destroyers previously scheduled for the year 2020. During a parliamentary audit at the Navy headquarters earlier this Wednesday, Navy Chief of Staff Hwang ki chul expressed confidence that the new timeline was feasible and that the nation would be able to deploy three additional KDX-3 Aegis ships before the year 2022. The Joint Chiefs of Staff is set to discuss the details of building the destroyers next month upon the request of the Navy. And then, added news. South Korea's national security chief is in the U.S. this week for meetings on regional and bilateral security issues with his U.S. counterpart. Kim Jiang-soo, the top security advisor to President Park Geun-hye, said Wednesday from Washington that he will discuss Seoul's request for a delay in the 2015 transfer of wartime operational control from the U.S. Kim also said Korea has not yet discussed adopting the U.S.-made Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, despite speculation to the contrary, but said Seoul will continue to explore its options with regard to U.S. missile defense systems. Kim is on a four-day trip to the U.S., which comes as Seoul braces for high-level talks with Beijing next month. And there has been some progress in inter-Korean relations in the form of an agreement between the two Koreas concerning the day-to-day -day operations at the joint Kaesang Industrial Complex. Seoul's Unification Ministry said Wednesday that both sides agreed to discuss and exchange work plans every weekday morning and hold weekly high-level meetings every Thursday. It's a follow-up deal to an earlier pact and also covers operating hours, meetings and exchange of information and emergency protocol. The Kaesang Industrial Complex, where over 100 South Korean companies operate, shut down for nearly six months earlier this year amid heightened inter-Korean tensions before reopening in mid-September. Over at the National Assembly, the spy agency's alleged interference in last year's presidential election continues to overshadow an ongoing parliamentary audit of the government. On Wednesday, Moon Jae-in, the candidate for the main opposition Democratic Party who 
ran against President Bakune, said the election was unfair and that regardless of whether his former rival was aware of the alleged activity, she has benefited the most from the outcome. Our political correspondent Kim Yeonji has the details. The rival parties are intensifying a war of words at the National Assembly over fresh allegations that the National Intelligence Service launched an extensive smear campaign against the opposition presidential candidates on the Internet and on social networking services ahead of the December election. The allegations come from testimony at a parliamentary audit on Monday by a senior prosecutor who headed a special probe into the NIS scandal before being dismissed from the team last week. The Defense Ministry's announcement this week that four members of the military's secretive Cyber Warfare Command Unit posted comments in favor of the ruling party on blogs and on Twitter before the December poll also added fuel to fire. The main opposition Democratic Party says the findings show that the integrity of the 2012 presidential election was compromised. They want President Park Geun-hye to apologize and provide measures to prevent similar incidents from recurring. Some Democratic Party lawmakers are even saying the 2012 presidential election was rigged and that the party must rethink whether it can accept its result. The ruling Sanuri party has in turn strongly criticized the opposition party for questioning the legitimacy of last year's election. This row between the rival parties over the spy agency scandal has taken center stage, overshadowing the ongoing annual parliamentary audit that should focus on evaluating major government policies. If the standoff continues, it is likely to delay the passage of next year's budget and other important bills aimed at supporting President Park's economic policies after the audit ends in early November. Some say the bipartisan row may even push the parliament to adopt a provisional budget for next year, which would be unprecedented. Kim Yeonji, Arirang News. The Korean government has slammed a YouTube video posted by Japan that lays claims to the Korea-controlled Tokdo Islets. Korea's foreign ministry summoned a representative from the Japanese embassy in Seoul on Wednesday to demand that Tokyo remove the video immediately. Seoul made clear that it will never tolerate the Japanese government making unjustified claims to the islets based on a, quote, mistaken historical perception or attempts to promote its claims internationally. Tokyo responded, however, that it will continue to promote its ownership of the islets to offer, quote, a better understanding of Japan. The YouTube video contends that Japan gained sovereignty over the rocky islets in the 17th century and reaffirmed its claim in 1905. On the nation's economic front, Korean companies have agreed to speed up investments worth some 9.5 billion U.S. dollars. Our correspondent Hwang Ji-ae reports how this comes after the government streamlined red tape and regulations. The Korean government's campaign to stimulate corporate investment may be beginning to bear fruits. The Ministry of Strategy and Finance said Wednesday that several major Korean companies have decided to spend more than 10 trillion won, or roughly 9.5 billion U.S. dollars in coming months to build new production or quality control facilities. The decisions came after the government took steps to streamline red tapes after hearing difficulties those companies faced. SK Global Chemical, a subsidiary of the nation's leading oil refiner SK Innovation, will invest $950 million later this month to build a factory in the southeastern port city of Ulsan. SOL Korea's third largest refiner will spend $7.5 billion next January to expand its refinery also in Ulsan. Hyundai Motor, the country's largest automaker, is due to break ground on its $560 million testing facility next February. The planned investments have been stalled due to tough regulations. The government has eased the regulations and revised related laws to speed up corporate spending on facilities. President Park Geun-hye's government, which has given top priority to stimulating investment, has found roughly $25 billion worth of projects being held up due to restrictive regulations. 
The Park administration has vowed to continue removing unessential regulations to promote investment. Hang Jie, Arirang News. The government is aiming to create 180,000 new jobs by the year 2017 through broader investment in technology. The plan announced by the ICT ministry on Wednesday includes a five-year blueprint that will focus on 10 key future technologies such as big data, fifth-generation mobile networks and intelligent software. The government plans to invest some 8 billion U.S. dollars in R&D. The plan falls in line with the Pakine administration's push for a creative economy where new ideas and innovative technologies lead to new jobs and markets. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plan given the current circumstances on your way to work or at home. Defense Ministry. The legislature will convene a... Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. The White House has denied claims that its national security agency tapped into the mobile phone of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. On Wednesday, White House Press Secretary Jay Carney said Washington is not monitoring and will not monitor the German leader's communications. During a phone conversation with the displeased chancellor, U.S. President Barack Obama also assured her that her communication was not being surveilled. Berlin has called the alleged spying completely unacceptable and has asked for an explanation. Earlier, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence denied a report from a French daily that Washington has eavesdropped on over 70 million phone calls in France, adding the report was inaccurate and contained misleading information. NATO and Russia could play a major key role in removing serious chemical weapons if they were asked to do so by the United Nations. The elimination of serious chemical arms was discussed at a meeting of NATO and Russian defense ministers in Brussels on Wednesday, the first of its kind in two years. NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen said he expects NATO allies and Russia to respond positively if the UN makes a request for help in destroying serious chemical weapons stockpile. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel also saw a possible role for NATO, which has thus far declined involvement in the Syrian conflict. But he stressed there were no plans to have any U.S. forces in Syria. The list of possible tasks for NATO allies and Russia could include protecting weapons inspectors and transportation and destruction of materials. If we can continue to... A North Korea expert from Austria has published his review of a tablet computer produced by the North that was released earlier this year. According to the review, the device is impressive in technology. Our Kim Min-ji tells us more. Professor Ludiger Frank from the University of Vienna in Austria has released his review of the North Korean-made tablet Sam Ji-young. Professor Frank said in his review published Tuesday on the website 38 North, he bought the tablet in Pyongyang in September for about 250 U.S. dollars. The device that he purchased was a SA-70 model released in March, which has a 7-inch screen and runs on Android. The professor said that the tablet contains a total of 488 pre-installed programs, including a multi-language dictionary, reference works, and e-books. The device also comes bundled with 14 games, including Korean chess and billiards, and the professor said the images are all of a high standard. The dictionary is available in six languages, Korean, Chinese, English, French, German, and Russian. The professor said that the quality of the dictionary was high, citing the large number of entries and dominance of English compared to other languages. The library also contains a wide variety of materials for the study of the Chute, or military first ideology, and writings about the ruling Kim family. The professor pointed out that it would be a good source of information for students of North Korean studies, adding that he hopes North Korea researchers will be inspired to make use of the indispensable resource. However, the professor also noted that the device seemed to have no way to connect to the Internet, nor was it really extraordinary for an Android in 2013.
He added that the gadget was not available to the average North Korean. But he did say that the device was satisfactory in terms of the technology and noted how rich in resources it was, saying that it's quite impressive for a country that has long been plagued by socialist inefficiencies. Kim min Arirang News. It's looking more and more likely that kimchi, Korea's staple food, will be added to UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage of humanity list this December. Korea's Cultural Heritage Administration said Wednesday that kimchi has now been given the status of inscribed by the UNESCO body responsible for reviewing nominations. Once an item is recommended as an inscribe, it almost always makes the final cut. A final decision will be handed down by UNESCO at a committee meeting this December. Korea currently has 15 items on this list, including the traditional singing style of pansori and the traditional song arirang. Korea's biggest fireworks festival will be kicking off in the southern poor city of Busan this coming Friday. Organizers say spectators can expect the most colorful display yet to light up the night sky. Our Polly tells us the best spots to catch the show. The Pusan Fireworks Festival will be kicking off this week for its ninth annual run. The brilliant spectacle of lights and explosions is expected to attract more than one million visitors from across Korea and abroad. Kwang An Bridge and Kwang Ah Lee Beach are the most popular spots as they offer front row seats to the event. This year's fireworks are said to be the brightest yet due to a greater use of larger pyrotechnic explosives. Green, red, yellow. These are the three primary colors that will be displayed along with three fireworks waterfalls. The falling fireworks will even be more magnificent than Niagara Falls. Ahead of the main event on October 26, high-tech laser shows and K-pop concerts will be held on Friday at Pexco Auditorium. Some of the main attractions featured during the mega fireworks display will include a one-kilometer stretch of cascading fireworks, as well as the festival's iconic Flight of the Phoenix. Organizers are optimistic that the good weather will hold up, but are ready for anything. This year's weather-based manual was created in advance. Following the manual, we will confirm whether to hold the fireworks festival three days before the event. This year's festival theme is celebrating Pusan's bicentennial anniversary of developing into a major metropolitan city. And what better way to do that than with a bang? Paul Yi, Arirang News. And a good morning to you all. Now, it's already Thursday, meaning two things. One, tomorrow's Friday, and two, the 2013 Korea Series kicks off later tonight as the Tucson Bears and the Samsung Lions square off at Tegu Stadium for Game 1. Now, for the Tucson Bears, it's been a tough road to the Korea Series as they face elimination in the first round against the Nexon Heroes before sweeping the last three games to advance to the second round against the LG Twins. Now, many players stepping up for Tucson during the LG series, but stamina issue is the main concern for them after playing nine games in the postseason. Meanwhile, for the Samsung Lions, who've been waiting all this time, have a well-rested team and are looking for their third straight championship. However, with some key players injured, including Kim Sang-soo, they too have some worries. Meanwhile, Game 1 starters for tonight, No Gyeong in for the Tucson Bears and Yoon sung hwan for the Samsung Lions. Well, with the start of one thing comes the end of another. South Korea's legendary defender Lee Young-pyo announced that he'll be retiring from football at the end of the season. 
The 36-year-old defender, who is currently playing for the Vancouver Whitecaps in the MLS, have come out stating that he will retire at the end of the season. The 2002 World Cup hero has played for many top-notch clubs such as PSV Eindhoven, Tottenham Hotspurs and Borussia Dortmund, to name a few, before settling in with the Vancouver Whitecaps. Now, Lee Young pyo was one of the more underrated players and has long been a quiet leader for the Korean national team. And moving on to some Wednesday night's KBL action. We had two games that took place last night. So to start things off with Anyang KGC still looking for that win number one as they went up against the first place Ursan Mobis Phoebus. Now, of course, going into the game here, Sean Evans with a monster first quarter, putting up 12 points in the quarter. But Mobis still takes a 21-17 lead after the first quarter before going into the second half with a 40-36 lead. Second half begins and here come the Anyang KGC. Kim yun tae with 13 points in the third quarter to help them rally and take a one-point lead before KGC closes things out in the fourth quarter with their first win of the season and against the best team in the league. 85-81 is your final score. And moving on, Busan KT Sonic Boom taking on the Incheon Etilan Elephants. A monster first quarter from KT as they outscore Etilan 31 8, including Ira Clark, who puts up an insane 18 points in the quarter. Second quarter, Etilan trying to come back as they trail 43 27 going into halftime. Third quarter, both sides go back and forth, but despite Incheon outscoring KT 19 15 in the fourth quarter, KT still hangs on to take this game 80 68 with Ira Clark finishing off with 26 points in the game. And finishing things off at the 2013 National Sports Festival, London gold medalist Yang Ak Sun, who injured his right ankle during practice, taped up his ankle and still competed for that gold and got what he wanted. The 21-year-old scores 15.112 after scoring 15.015 in the first attempt and then a 15.150 in the second attempt. Despite the pain, the score was good enough for a first place finish, beating Seoul's Shin Su Char, who finished off with a silver medal with 14.412. Now, on a side note, Yang Ak Sun also competed in the ring event but finished in fifth place. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Happy Thursday morning to you. I'm Lee Han with your latest weather forecast. Well, October has been a beautiful mild month. Well, we did have late October typhoon, but overall, it's been fairly nice. And as for today, it looks like we'll continue to see clear skies with similar morning lows as yesterday. But daytime highs will be about 4 degrees lower than yesterday. As daytime highs in Seoul is expected to top out at 18 degrees Celsius. And Busan and Jeju might see some early morning showers with uh, less than 4 millimeters of rainfall. And speaking of rain, it only rained about three times so far this month here in the Seoul and surrounding area. So the air is pretty dry, which could easily start a fire. So please keep that in mind and always be careful with fire. Now tomorrow is gonna be a chilly one. Afternoon should be breezier than today and temperature will be dropping to mid teens in the most region but we will have a fair amount of sunshine. But the morning low will plunge to 7 degrees here in the capital so it will feel like early winter again. And guys, uh, wearing a muffler should help you to keep warm because it increased 3 to 5 degrees of body temperature so take out mufflers and dressing layers to stay warm well with that in mind let's take a closer look at the readings for today uh, the afternoon high in Seoul will only make it to 18 degrees Celsius which is 64 degrees in Fahrenheit while Daegu, Gwangju and Busan will all get up to 21 degrees Celsius now let's see how other regions are looking uh, the high in Jeju and Daejeon should be at 20 degrees Celsius while Dokdo will get up to 17 and if Mount Kungang will stay on the double digits today at 12. Now that's all for Korea and here is the global forecast for viewers around the world.
That's all for me at this hour. Hope you have a lovely day and back to you soon in the studio. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Thank you for watching. Thank <music> you.